Amen. Thank you, Karen. And a, it's, it's a wonderful job on a, a very nice arrangement. Let's all stand as we sing our call to worship this morning. Angels from the realms of glory. Angels from sunshine poking out this morning. Amen. Amen. A few announcements as we get going. Don't forget that tonight at 5 p.m. is our children's Christmas play tonight. The birth of Jesus. And I know they've been putting in a lot of hard work, so y'all come and join us and support them in that. And then right after that is the Christmas Cookie Fellowship. If you don't come for the play, come for the cookies. Amen. <laughs> and then uh, that's going to be directly following the play tonight. And then the Christmas Eve candlelight service is on Christmas Eve at 5 p.m. Now, note in your bulletins here, there was a typo. It says, Saturday, it says Saturday, December 24th. That's wrong. It should be Friday, December the 24th. Don't come on Saturday. Come on Friday at 5 p.m. for the Christmas Eve candlelight service. And then there'll be no Wednesday services this week. No 8.30 a.m. service next Sunday. There's two Wednesdays we will not have service, the 22nd and the 29th. There will be no Wednesday night services, so keep that in mind. And then no, 30, no 8.30 a.m. service next Sunday. And if you're interested in the children or student ministries, we're going to have an uh, information meeting on Sunday, January the 2nd at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in children or student ministries, join us at that meeting on January the 2nd, 5 p.m. And then uh, we're collecting donations for the tornado relief effort through the Southern Baptist Convention. And so if you would like to give towards that, make the check payable to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church with tornado relief in the memo. And uh, they would appreciate that. And it's, the, and it's the time of year also for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And uh, our goal is $12,000 this year. And as Dan's mentioned several times, 100% of that, none of it stays here at this church. 100% of it goes directly to the International Mission Board missionaries and their ministries. And so uh, if, you want, if you were signed up to come to the turkey shoot, of course, I hope you got the call out or the message or something that it was postponed because of the weather. Wet turkey's no good, all right? <laughs> so we're, we've moved it till Wednesday, Wednesday at 2 p.m. if you're able to make it. I know some of you might not be able to. I'm sorry about that. But if you can, Wednesday at 2 p.m., we will... Have the turkey shoot then. When we look at the unreached people groups in our part of the world and in most of the world, their preference to learn is through stories, it's through morality. You come in with God's stories and you're seeing His Spirit changing lives. I've seen it. I've told stories and they listen and they love it and they begin to ask us questions. And if God opens the door to where we can continue to tell them more and more stories. And out of that ministry, we began to see we needed more people to do this ministry. And where are we going to get them? 
We wanted the people that we were training to train other people, and so we began teaching in the pastor's schools, and the, the student pastors were excited about it. They said it's something that we use, it's applicable, it works. They already speak the language, they wear the same clothes, they eat the same food. All we have to do is help them to understand methods and ways that they can reach their people. The people that we're training now are the product of missionaries who came before me. They accepted Christ under these missionaries. We're training them in schools that IMB Money helped to fund, to build. It's an amazing thing. You can pray, keep the mission going. You can give, keeps the mission going. And you can go. Look at me. I used to sell tire supplies. <laughs> Here I am teaching people how to tell stories. <laughs> Thanks for praying and giving and come on over. Just one of the missionaries you support through your giving to this particular offering. You should also know that throughout the year, as we contribute to the cooperative program, you, you support these missionaries as well. But every penny of this offering, as Jeff said a moment ago, <clears throat> goes specifically to help those in their international mission field. <clears throat> so we want to encourage you to give faithfully to that. <clears throat> I do want to share with you this morning, uh, the flower arrangement down here is from Sue McGregor's funeral and homegoing celebration service. I was privileged to be a part of that. Um, you might notice there's candy in there. If you know anything about Sue, she always had candy in her purse. She was always giving candy out to the kids. So that's a celebration of her and her life. We know she is so much better off. But I want to read to you the statement from the family. The McGregor family wishes to express thanks to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church for the use of the facilities and the homegoing of our mother, Sue McGregor. Thank you to Pastor Dan, Doug, Jeannie, Karen, and Con for making the service a truly memorable service. A special thanks to Jeff and Anna for keeping the young ones in the nursery so that family could attend. We appreciate all the prayers and condolences given by the congregation. Sue will be missed, but she is in a far better place. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> As we come today, we want to ask God to prepare our hearts to be in his presence. In this special season of Christmas where we celebrate his birth, we want to be reminded that he is alive in us every day, and we can celebrate him in all that we do. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for amazing grace. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. Thank you for being willing to leave heaven and come to earth and be born in humble circumstances, that you might live a life, set an example for us, but then that you would give your life so that we could have forgiveness. You would rise from the grave so that we'd have eternal life. God, we want to celebrate you today. May we honor and glorify you in all we do. It's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and today uh, to help us in lighting uh, the Advent candle is the guys' family. It's Dennis and Tracy. So y'all come forward and help as we uh, light the candle and share in scripture and prayer. The Advent wreath is a circle with no beginning and no end. It is a symbol of endless love and faithfulness. Out of darkness, light shines, pointing us in hope to the one who came to overcome the darkness of the world and to be our light in, this, in the world to come. Three weeks ago, we lit the prophecy candle and remember those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. He's done that before. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we lit the Bethlehem candle, a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. Last week, we lit the shepherd's candle, remembering the first in a long line of people who joyfully shared the good news of the Savior's birth. The fourth candle on the Advent wreath is called the Angel's Candle. It reminds us of the hope fulfilled in the first coming of our Savior as the angels announced it 
and of our continuing hope as we anticipate his coming again. Four candles burning bright, chasing away the darkness with light. Four candles glowing bright, the blessing of God giving new sight. Our scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 7 verses 10 through 14. And then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz saying, Ask the sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or as high as the heavens. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you may also try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord shall, God shall give you self a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with a child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Let us pray. Mighty God and creator of the earth, create in us a pure heart and renew within us a steadfast spirit. May the hope fulfilled in Bethlehem permeate our lives. God of angels and sheep, God of poor and meek, in these days before Christmas, quiet us now so we may hear where new life is struggling to be born. Slow our rush so we may hear from your Holy Spirit and the words whispered in hope. Open our hearts to the wonders of Emmanuel, God with us. You have given us a living hope by raising Christ from the dead. Enliven our hope as we live in expectation of your coming again. Maranatha, Lord, please come quickly. Amen. Thank you. The scripture tells us of the wise men who came from the east and followed the star that led them to the Christ child. And they came and they worshiped him and they gave him gifts. The choir would like to share a song this morning. It sings about that star of Bethlehem that, uh, that guided them and guides us today in, uh, in a different sense, but still guides us to the Christ child, okay. Jesus, the Christ, our hope.
appreciate the choir and all those folks there. I think it's a blessing for me. It's a blessing to be able to minister to so many talented people. We've got another coming up right now. Judy, Julie Mathis is going to come and share an arrangement of Joy to the World uh, on flute. So, Julie. And accompanied by Karen Buchanan. Oh, I'm sorry. Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church. Thanks. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Amen. Wow. That was fantastic. And I'll tell you, you may not know, Joy to the World is, is composed, Isaac Watts wrote the words, but George Frederick Handel, who wrote the Messiah, Hallelujah Chorus, etc., also, he wrote the music to this song we're about to sing. We're going to sing what she just played. <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing, Joy to the World. 
Yeah, not exactly. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and nature sing. And Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. seated. We're going to sing now uh, another song, very familiar, Silent Night, Holy Night, done with a, a very quiet background to it. I'd like for you to join as we sing together. Silent Night. <laughs>
I'd like to ask Gail. Gail Jordan. I've lost her. Where? There she is. Gail's going to share a song of this season, which uh, uh, speaks again. That silent night that we just sang about is uh, a holy night, a very special night. So Gail, you share with us. stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul
Cancer survivor. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Titus chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 this morning. Here we are less than a week before Christmas, and everywhere we look, we see reminders of Christmas. I'm grateful for the beautiful decorations in the sanctuary and throughout the church, and everywhere we go, we see reminders of Christmas. The choir reminded us of the season last week as they shared the Christmas story through song. This afternoon, the children will remind us through their play of the birth of Christ and the celebration of the season. Some of you love getting your Christmas stuff out as soon as possible. <clears throat> some of you will get it out well before Thanksgiving and start decorating and getting it out. And some of you will even continue keeping it up past New Year's. Don't you know there's a law against that? <laughs> they can arrest you. And I'm just, just kidding. Some of you can't wait till the radio stations start playing Christmas music. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there are some of you, you've had your radio in your vehicle tuned to Christmas music the whole season. <laughs> See? <laughs> Others, however, do everything they can to avoid Christmas, do everything they can to not deal with the celebrations, the decorations, because perhaps things have happened in life and, and Christmas is different. Each of us has different memories, good and bad, about Christmas, and even certain traditions that are specific to our families, like the fact that my family, we typically make our way at some point to Waffle House on Christmas Day. It generally happens, and it all started when Janice was pregnant with Haley. Uh, it fell on Christmas Day, and uh, we had a 10 o'clock service that morning, and my mom happened to be in the hospital, so we were headed to the hospital, and we thought, well, we'll just get some lunch on the way there. <laughs> Guess who's open? Waffle House, the only place open. So that's kind of been a thing we've done for years now, as life moves forward, Christmas begins to change. The dynamic in the family changes when kids start having their boyfriends and girlfriends as a part of that, and they become family members, and then their grandkids, and all those things. Christmas takes a different shape every year. However, for those of us who are Christians, there should be one constant to Christmas. For us, there should be the constant reminder that the real reason for the season is to celebrate the life of our Savior, of the birth of of Christ. God loved us enough to leave heaven and come to earth to a humble stable in Bethlehem so that he could live among us. However, we know that it was not just to live among us and set the example for how we're to live. It was also to die on the cross, to pay the price for our sins. It was to claim the victory over sin through his shed blood and then walk out of the grave under his own power. Then after appearing alive from the grave to many people, he ascended to heaven and intercedes for us until the time comes for him to call out the church, judge the world of sin, establish his millennial reign on earth, fight one final battle, and then usher in a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. That's what we should be living in light of every day. Christmas, the reality of a living Savior that is not removed from our condition is something we should be living out every day. If you came today expecting to hear the typical Christian season message. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come back Christmas Eve, you'll get that message that day. But today we're wrapping up or, or working on closing out Titus uh, as we're nearing the end of this study. And in looking at this text, we're going to learn the practical application of how we should live our lives in light of the birth of Christ. Paul instructs us to live in light of the fact that Jesus saved us from our sins. So I want you to join me as we take a look at what Paul has to say to Titus about instructing believers at Crete and ultimately us about how we should live as followers of Christ. So Titus chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 and I'll ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, 
He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. May the Lord add richly to the reading of His Word. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your love. We thank You for amazing grace. And God, I thank You that this Word is not a truth, but is the truth. God, open our hearts and minds that we might hear from You today and apply Your truth. Lord, I pray that I might decrease, that You might increase. It's in Your powerful name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we examine our text this morning, we're going to look at what he desires of me, what I was, what he did, and what my response should be. So first of all, let's look at what he desires of me. In verses 1 and 2, we see where Paul gives us seven duties or responsibilities that we have as Christians. First, we are to submit to the rulers and authorities. We have responsibility to remember that God has placed people in leadership over us in the community, in the state, in the nation, and they are there for a reason. Certainly we should pray for them. We should lift them up. We should ask God to work in their lives, to help them lead in a way that glorifies Him. But even when when they don't honor God in the decisions they make, we still have a responsibility to respect the position, even if we can't respect the person. I'm grateful to be a part of a church that has a group of people that supports law enforcement, that respects our military and loves our country. If it's within our power and not contradictory to the Word of God, we should support leadership and we should respect the laws of the land and encourage others to do the same. I don't agree with every tax or even understand the logic behind every law or code. However, I want to honor God, so I'll do my best to respect the authority that He's placed over me in this community, in this state, and in this nation. To honor our Savior, we should submit to those in authority. Not submit to the point of compromising our faith but to submit to the extent that we honor God. Second, we are to obey those in authority. Now, one of the challenges of that is that sometimes authority doesn't always do what we want to do or we don't don't understand why they're doing certain things. Uh, I know uh, going through this process of of starting on property and putting a new home and doing all those kinds of things, there are certain codes and laws in place. And I'll have to say the folks that I've dealt with at the courthouse have been a blessing. They've been nothing but kind and helpful. Uh, to me in this process. I am not a general contractor. I uh, am not familiar with all those things that that go on and all the permits that have to be pulled and all those sorts of things. I'm also very grateful for our resident help right here. Lloyd Jarrett's been a help to me and guiding me along the way. But admittedly, there's some things that I don't understand the reason behind certain things, but it is the law of the land or the code of the county, if you will. So we are to acknowledge that and to obey the guidelines that have been put in place. Third, Paul tells us to be ready for every good work. The heart of the Christian, the spirit of the Christmas season, should be to serve others. I'm so blessed to be in a church that is willing to serve others. So many of you are witnessing an example to this community by the genuine willingness you have to step up and serve whenever there is a need. I've been so grateful for your willingness to support our bus ministry as children and young people have come in. You've been supportive. You've been encouraging in that way, whether it's giving financially to help things make happen or rolling up your sleeves and jumping in and helping, you've modeled a willingness to serve others. Fourth, Paul exhorts us to slander no one. Now, the Greek word there is the word we get our English word blasphemy from, and the point here is that we should not curse or speak with contempt about anyone. Yes, even those that would malign the faith, even those are people that Christ died for, and we shouldn't be contemptuous toward them. I must confess that I struggle with this in regard to those who hate Christianity or hate this country. For me, those who hate this country are either jealous or ignorant. Either they're jealous of the success of this country or they're ignorant of how blessed they are to be in this country compared to what things might be like in other places. But the Word of God makes it clear that we're to love everyone, and our responsibility first and foremost is to honor God. My duty to this country is secondary to my duty to my Savior, and how I represent Him is far more important than my patriotism. But let me be clear, 
I will never apologize for my patriotism. (laughs) Fifth, Paul reminds us to avoid fighting. Don't be quarrelsome or belligerent in how you treat others. Remember, a kind or gentle, gentle answer turns away wrath. Some seem to always be ready to argue and seem to sit on the edge of their seat just waiting for someone to question them or their authority on a matter. Just because someone has a question or even pushes back a little doesn't mean that they don't respect your opinion. But perhaps as a Christian, you could learn to respect the opinion of others as well. Perhaps there's value in listening more and talking less. Perhaps there's my opinion and your opinion and then God's will, and they're not necessarily the same. We need to come together and work toward understanding God's will. Maturity in the faith demands that we are not contentious or quarrelsome, but instead love God enough to show respect and kindness to others. Sixth, we're told by Paul to be kind. Now this comes from a Greek word that has to do with being moderate, fair, and forbearing in how we treat others. Uh, Can I confess that many times for me it's the people that I love the most that are the closest to me that is hardest sometimes to be kind to, not because they don't deserve my kindness, but as the old expression goes, familiarity breeds contempt. Because we're around one another so much, sometimes I'm not kind like I should be. Sometimes I don't treat my family the way that I should, and I apologize to my family for that. As brothers and sisters in the faith, let us not become so familiar with one another that we don't show kindness to one another, that we do behave in a mature way as believers, as followers of Christ. Just because you're wired a certain way doesn't give you an excuse to be unkind and behave like an adult bully. Paul says in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. That's not just a good suggestion from the Word of God. That's wise counsel that we would, should follow if we're going to honor God. It doesn't cost anything to be kind. Seventh, Paul tells us to show gentleness to all people. Now this word can be translated as consideration, meekness, or humility. Jesus said of himself, I am gentle and humble in heart. The trait of our Savior is one that we should emulate. I'm afraid that the lost world has seen too many Christians who are hateful. The world, the lost world around us too many times knows what we're against more than they know what we're for. As Christians, we shouldn't condone sin, but as Christians, we should love people even in the midst of their sin. Not saying that the sin is okay, but simply trying to elevate them and point them to Christ and help them see the love of Christ in us. Don't Abandon the lost for making choices that lost people make. Instead, love them in the midst of that, but don't condone the sin. Love them in spite of their sin and show them the love of Christ that is gentle and humble in in heart. So Paul gives us some clear exhortations of what God desires of me. But secondly, I want you to see what I was. What I was in verse 3, Paul reminds Titus and us about our lives before coming to faith. Now some would read this and go, man, Paul sure is being mean to lost people. (laughs) Don't forget, Paul knew what it was like to be lost. Until he he met Christ on the road to Damascus, he knew what it was like to be lost. So when he begins to talk about this, he's talking about what he was before he came to faith in Christ. And he said we were once foolish. Now this comes from a Greek word that has to do with a complete lack of understanding in a particular area. And when it comes to the things of God, before we came to faith in Christ, we couldn't understand the things of God. We were foolish in in light of the things of God. We couldn't wrap our minds around the idea that someone would give us something so generous for free. When you stop and consider it for the lost world to reject the free gift of God, and on one hand makes sense because it doesn't make sense to them, on the other hand, it is complete foolishness. Because in the midst of their lostness, they deny the existence of God and reject their need to repent and trust in Him. Second, Paul reminds us that we were disobedient. Our human nature is bent on disobedience. If you don't understand this, either you've never had children or you've never worked with children. We're all born with a disobedient bent. All of us. If you've ever spent any time around children at all, you've probably had some instant where You told them not to do something, and as they were on the way to do something, they were looking back at you and ignoring what you said. You've probably experienced that somewhere along the way. 
Jeremiah reminds us that this bent on disobedience comes from the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, he says this, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? It amazes me when the lost world says, follow your heart. <laughs> that's what your heart is right there. But just in case you think, well, that's an Old Testament concept. No. Jesus said this, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. That's what's in our heart. It's when God cleans us up. It's when God changes us from the inside out that our hearts can become pure. Dennis alluded to it in his prayer this morning, created me a clean heart from the psalmist. God wants to change us. He wants to transform us from within, but the heart without God is disobedient. Third, Paul says that we were deceived. Now, we were purposely led astray. The lost world doesn't recognize that Satan is real and that he is purposely trying to deceive them and cause them to think that God doesn't exist and that this is the only life there is. You know, do whatever you want. There are no consequences. Grab everything you can now because after this, that's all there is. The lost are enslaved by sin and by Satan, but their deceitful thinking, uh, they think that they're in charge. They, they're deceived by him. That's why so many have tried to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he was more than just a good man or a prophet. He was indeed the Son of God. If he is the Son of God, there are consequences for my sin. And what I do with Jesus has eternal consequences. I'm grateful that I'm not living in deception. I'm grateful that I'm not living in the deception of the world. I'm grateful that as the old gospel song says, praise the Lord, I saw the light. Fourth, we were enslaved by various passions and pleasures. In Romans 3, Paul addresses the reality that we're all sinners. As it is written, there is none, no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. If you think you're the exception, <laughs> I've got bad news for you. All have turned away. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a single one of us who has not committed sin. The, the flesh is sinful. There's this constant battle with the flesh. We're pl prone to doing things that please ourselves and feed our appetites. You don't have to dive very far into the fabric of our society to see that there are so many things around us that feed the desires within the wicked heart of man from commercials that appeal to the eye with attractive models to alcohol commercials that appeal to the desire to escape life and the pressures that life brings. God, however, is the source of peace. God is the source of fulfillment. He is the only one who can transform our hearts and give us truly abundant life. Fifth, Paul reminds us that we were living in malice and envy. Simply put, malice is evil. It's having a vicious character toward others. We're going to examine Herod the Great a little bit about him on our, in our Christmas Eve service. Herod was absolutely afraid that somebody was going to take his job. He was constantly, overly aware of people around him who were a threat to his throne. So much so that he killed his own sons and his wife because they were potential successors to his throne. He was a wicked, evil man. Envy is not a good quality at all, and it's a clear sign of selfishness. We ought to be happy for the success of others. I like the way John MacArthur in his commentary on this text says it. Envy is a sin that carries its own reward. It guarantees its own frustration and disappointment. By definition, the envious person cannot be satisfied with what he has and will always crave more. What a sad place to live. And the Christian must mature, mature beyond this attitude. Six, Paul reminds us that we were hateful, detesting one another. The natural outgrowth of envy is that you'll be hateful. You'll want what others have, so those others that have, you hate them because they have what you want. This is the very nature of turning a culture from capitalism to socialism and communism. Create an air of hatred toward anyone that has more than you, and if you can use a false narrative about racism, that's a convenient method to get there. Never mind that they worked harder or were simply smarter. 
I'm not trying to be ugly to anyone, but I am not foolish enough to think that I'm the smartest person in this room. I know I'm not. If you think you are, (laughs) you're probably not. Um, There are plenty of people around us who are smarter than we are. And people who have, generally speaking, have worked to get where they are. They've put in the time. Whether it's an athlete, whether it's a celebrity, whatever the case may be, they've done the things necessary along the way to get to where they are. I am not naive enough to think that somehow I deserve the pay of a physician. I could not handle the, the biology or the anatomy of physiology. That <laughs> I, I don't have that much interest in it, and I just don't have the aptitude to commit that stuff to memory. I don't, have, I don't have a problem with a doctor making what a doctor makes. That, I'm, I don't begrudge them of that. And there are certainly others who make a lot more than doctors, especially nowadays. But the reality is, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to rejoice with one another, not be envious of others. The lost world is envious. So we see what he desires of me, and we see what I was. But next we need to see what he did. Now, verses 4 through 7 tell us what God did for us. Through the kindness of His grace, He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for our sins. We're not saved by our works, and praise God, we're not kept saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith. We're kept saved by God's grace. We're washed in the blood of Christ and renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to live in bondage to the old ways anymore because the Holy Spirit in us helps us overcome the temptation to sin. We can begin to do things that we should do that we've already examined in this text, like being ready for every good work, like being kind, through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. God hasn't just given us a little bit of Himself. He has poured out His Holy Spirit upon us, but He will only fill that part of our lives that we give to Him. Whatever we give of ourselves, whatever we open up of ourselves, He'll fill it. But we need to open up. When I was, I don't know, probably 11 or so years old, my aunt and grandmother moved from the Decatur area to Fort Myers, Florida. Now, if you're not familiar with Fort Myers, is when you get to Tampa, you ain't there yet. Keep going. Um, If you get to Naples, you've passed it. But nevertheless, they used to live down there, and every year we'd make that journey from Augusta to Fort Myers twice a year, sometime during the summer, and then usually at Christmas, we'd go down there. Now, for my dad and I, who who were golfers, summertime was great because that was the off season. So the golf prices were cheap that time of year. We could go play golf. The only thing, if you know anything about Florida weather, you could count on sometime that afternoon, if you were getting the afternoon rates, you were probably going to have to pull off under a tree somewhere and let the rain go by and then go back out there. But at least after the rain, it was good and cool. It wasn't. Let me clarify. If you know Florida weather, it just was like a sauna after that, so not any good. But one of the things I remember about those trips, on on one of the main highways there in Fort Myers, there was this huge golf shop. And every time we went down there, we would go into that golf shop, and there were clubs all around, and there was equipment and, and clothing and all sorts of stuff in that store. But one of the things I remember about that store is not too far from the register there at the front of the store, there was this huge bin of tees, golf tees. And there was a sign, there was a set price, I have no idea what it was, I don't remember that now, but you could reach into that bin and you could grab out a handful of golf tees and whatever you pulled out, the price on the sign, that's what you paid for those tees. A little caveat though, they had a bag that was a little bit restrictive, uh, that you couldn't just fit everything into that, but you could only reach in there and pull out one handful and that's what the cost was. Well, of course, whenever I would stick my hand down in that bend of tees, I'd just go, "Uh uh-uh. I'd get my hand down in there, I'd work my hand in those tees as much as I could, and I'd grab out as many as I could of those tees, and I'd have tees sticking out all around out of my hand, and I'd get as many of them in carefully into that bag as I could while my dad held that bag while I'd put those tees in there. The reason that I did that, I wanted to get all that I could because it didn't make sense to settle for less. The reason we don't have as much of God as we should is because we've settled for less. We've come to Him with our hands closed or our lives closed. We've not opened up and said, God, fill me. 
fill me with your prayers, presence. Pour yourself into me. I'm giving you access to every area in my life. We have the power of God at our wishes, at our desire. We, we can open ourselves up to him. We can allow him to fill us. We can allow him to pour himself into us fully. But we come to him with our hands closed saying, God, I want to know you. No, God, I want to know you. Please fill me to overflowing. And let him fill you so much that literally your life spills out on those around you because God is so clearly in you. So we find what he desires of me, what I was and what he did. But finally, let's examine what my response should be. I should do what Paul says to do in verse 8. I need to encourage others to do these things and do these things myself. We need to be devoted to good works because this is profitable or beneficial in, for all of us in the faith to deny God by the way that we live, to live in the things that beset us before we came to Christ, is to fail to understand and appreciate the grace that's been shown to us. Now, one of the things that I've had to do a little bit of on my property is I've had to cut some trees up. I had some logs down that I needed to cut them up, and I spent some time out there cutting them up. Now, imagine if you came by there and you saw that the only thing I had was an old handsaw. Now, by old hand saw, I'm talking about one of those after you finish cutting, you could put it up there and you could play it, okay? That kind of old hand saw. You with me? Those that, so if y'all don't know about playing a saw, it's okay. It's all right. But you ain't country. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, imagine I was out there just sawing away with one of those saws, and, and you saw me out there doing that, and you saw this huge pile of wood, and you thought, Lord have mercy, that preacher, bless his heart. I'm going to go over to the store. And you go over to the store, and you get me a commercial grade, top of the line, chainsaw, gas-powered chainsaw. I'm talking about the kind of thing that makes most men in this room grunt, okay? You with me? And you bring that to me, and you give that to me, and you say, preacher, I want you to have this. Now imagine if you give that to me, and I look at you and go, you know, I really like this handsaw. I really, really, really like this handsaw, and I just want to keep right on going here, taking forever to do what I could do a whole lot better. That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? God offers us so much more than what we have without Him. Why in the world would we settle for an old handsaw when He wants to give us something so much more powerful? So much more powerful. He wants to give us Himself. He wants us, he wants us to understand that He can help us through things in life. Listen, just because you place your faith in God doesn't mean all your problems are going away. But when you place your faith in God, you have him to help you through your problems. I don't, I don't remember where I read it yesterday or where I saw it or whatever, but the reality is when the people of Israel came to the Red Sea, God didn't wipe out the Red Sea. He just parted it so they could go through. When it comes to your problems, God's not going to wipe out your problems, but he is going to make a way through if you'll look to him, if you'll trust him. Live your life like you appreciate the grace that's been shown to you by letting God lead your life. Let the Holy Spirit give you the power to overcome the enemy in your life. Let others see the power of God to change a life as they see God change your life. In light of what God desires of me and knowing what I used to be, I want to live for Him because He lived and died for me. Now that doesn't mean that I won't still struggle with sin. If you think that Christians don't struggle with sin, then you better cover up Romans 7 in your Bible. Christians still struggle with sin. It's still a battle. But aren't you glad God gave us the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin? One of the marks of the fact that you know you're a Christian is when you sin and the Holy Spirit convicts you. Paul says the Holy Spirit is a seal in our lives of faith, of our faith in God. When we sin, we ought to feel conviction. Listen, if you can sin and not feel conviction, you're on dangerous ground. Either you don't know Christ or you're so, as we like to say as Baptists, backslidden that you've hardened your heart to God and you need to repent desperately. When I, when I sin, I feel conviction and I'm grateful for it because when I repent of that sin, my fellowship with God can be restored. It can be renewed. Listen, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you're never going to feel conviction for sin. Well, you can change all of that right now. You say, well, I don't want to feel conviction for sin. I like sin. Here's the problem. 
Sin's only fun for a season. And it may be fun your whole life. But there's going to come a time when you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account of your life and what you've done with Christ. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm not making this up. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you'll spend your eternity ultimately in a lake of fire. Nobody here will be able to do anything for you after you're gone. You can light a million candles and it is not going to change your eternity. If you didn't place your faith in Christ, you'll spend your eternity in hell. But Jesus said, I don't want that for you. I'm going to leave heaven. I'm going to come to earth. I'm going to come in a humble stable. I'm not going to announce it to the whole world. I'm just going to tell a few shepherds. I'm going to tell a few wise men who will come a little later. But I'm going to let the world know I've come by living and I'm going to allow them to see people who belong to me tell them about me. He did that for us. And then He went to a cross. He shed His blood for our sins. It didn't end there, thankfully. Yeah, He was laid in a tomb, but it was barred because He wasn't going to need it long. He walked out of that tomb. And He's alive and well today. He ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And if you don't know Him, please let me introduce you to Him today. He is the Savior of the world. And He'll save you if you'll ask His forgiveness. Don't waste this time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank You for this season of Christmas. I thank You that it was prophesied from long ago. Lord, You fulfill that prophecy after some 400 years of silence from the prophets. God, Christ was born at Your perfect timing, in Your perfect place, in Your perfect way. But God, I pray for anyone here today who's not experienced His birth in their life. Right now, if they don't change things, if they don't admit their sin and place their faith in You, God, their eternity is headed directly to hell. And I know that's not the desire of your heart. As a matter of fact, your word makes it clear. It's your desire that none should perish. So God, I pray they'd have the wisdom to admit their sin and to ask your forgiveness and place their trust in you. God, I understand there are others here who are hurting, who are going through various things in their life, who belong to you. And God, I pray we'd have the courage and the wisdom to trust those things to you right now, to let go of it and know you'll meet our every need. Whatever the need right now during this invitation time, we give this time to you. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Have thine own way. Wash me just now. 